from there. Thanks, Benji. I see we have recording in progress. Uh, my name is Jeff Letterman. I'm an Education and Skills Supervisor with Fish and Wildlife Outreach. I'm really excited today to have um, Kelly Ameth and Stephen Yang with us from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I worked for many years at the PCA, so fond memories of working there and actually including working on this issue, talking about lead and the impacts it has specifically on our loon population, but on other animals and uh, what we can do about that and the alternatives that are out there. And there's been a lot of progress since I worked on it many years ago. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly and Steven to introduce themselves and we'll get started. Thanks, Jeff and Benji. I'm Kelly Amoth. I'm one of the program coordinators with the Get the Let Out program. I'm Steven, I'm the other program coordinator for the Get the Let Out program. Uh, thank you guys for having us today. We're really excited to share about uh, the work of Get the Let Out. Uh, this is the second go around of this program um, and we're really hoping we can help everybody make some, let us let everybody know what we're doing about lead-free alternatives uh, to help wildlife in Minnesota. So I will go ahead and share my presentation and um, if there are questions, just please put them in the question box and we'll get to them at the end. I was going to say while you're sharing that, Kelly, that if you, Kelly has a couple links during the program and we'll post those in the chat function. So we can try to keep the questions in the Q&A section and the links we'll post in the chat that way you can click on those and open those in your browser. So. We are seeing it now, Kelly, it's looking good. You are muted though, and so is Steven. <laughs> all right, there we go. Very Thank good. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Hard to find all the buttons on WebEx. So, uh, so Steven and I are working on the Get the Let Out program. Um, and some of you may hopefully remember this program from the first iteration uh, the Get the Let Out program ran as Jeff shared uh, from 2000 to about 2010, was very successful during that time. Um, the staff of the program did over 200 tackle exchanges. Uh, the photo on the left shows uh, the setup of a tackle exchange outside of Joe's Sporting Goods in St. Paul. Um, People could bring in their lead tackle and pick up samples of lead free alternatives. Um, so they did 200 of those around the state. They collected over 8,000 pounds of lead um, and gave away 50,000 sample packs of lead free alternatives, which we are still giving away lead sample packs. They look a little different now. Um, and we're still working to collect lead around the state. And so the program uh, was really clicking along for about a decade and then um, just uh, some funding issues cause it to end right in 2010, uh, right around the timing of what brought us back, which is the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, which was on April 20th of 2010. This was the largest uh, marine oil spill in our history. Um, and if you remember that oil spill, um, I remember the coverage of it on TV. Uh, the just seeing the underwater cameras of oil spilling uncontrolled out into the Gulf of Mexico until September of that year. So 210 million gallons of crude oil spilled into the Gulf and affected an unknown number of uh, marine wildlife, everything from mammals, fish, uh, reptiles, amphibians, affecting the landscape as well. Um, and so the most effective oops, way to clean up the oil spill was actually using chemical dispersants uh, to actually um, get the oil out of the environment. The spread of the oil is the area in red. Um, so it touched a lot of the Gulf um, and a lot of the Gulf states. And so, um, and it settled over 100 feet deep too. So, and if you've lived in the area, you follow the weather, this is a, that's where hurricane season is as well. And so that oil would continue to get churned up during hurricane season as well. I know for me during that time, I would see photos like this and that oil spill felt really far away. 
um, because we were seeing pictures in the Gulf of uh, pelicans like this one just covered in oil and it felt like it was just a localized event. Um, I always, I've done this presentation for a lot of different age groups and when I talk to kids, I always make sure to share that uh, if, if somebody could take the picture of this pelican then somebody could probably grab it um, and hopefully clean it up and return it um, to the wild. And so uh, what the crude oil did, especially to birds is actually um, affected the, their feathers and how their feathers are, are whole, held together. Um, feathers are like zippers. They have a little barbules on them. And so that crude oil got through that feather, the, the feathers, unzipped them and exposed these birds to um, the environment. And so a lot of birds actually died from exposure. And what happened post Deepwater Horizon is a lot of research um, began to see how this oil spill was going to affect the ecosystem, um, which brings us to loons because um, our Minnesota loons are unfortunately only here with us in Minnesota for a short amount of time. And they actually spend most of their time away from here, which is hard to believe. And so um, during the recovery efforts, uh, re research started to happen to really pinpoint the location of Minnesota loons and really find out how this oil spill or did this oil spill affect their health? And so one of the big projects um, was led by the US Geological Survey um, out of their Midwest office. They inserted uh, these transmitters into 37 loons um, for right in 2010 through 2015. Um, and they uh, captured the loons at night. They inserted these geolocators so they could track uh, where they were going, how far they were diving, uh, when they weren't moving to really find out about their migratory patterns. And so this is one of the loons uh, with one of those uh, transmitters inserted into it. You can see the an antenna sticking up. And so this research actually really pinpointed that Minnesota loons were right in the Gulf of Mexico during the oil spill. And uh, they go to the Gulf because it's rich with fish in the wintertime um, and they uh, just have a great place to spend their winter away from Minnesota. And so this research led to the state of Minnesota applying to um, the Natural Resource Damage Assessment Fund, uh, which was formed post Deepwater Horizon. Uh, and we applied for an open ocean grant. And this recognized that wildlife outside of the Gulf of Mexico was also affected by Deepwater Horizon. And um, that was funded and completely by British Petroleum, the uh, owners of the oil rig. And Minnesota is one of two states that actually received one of these open ocean grants um, to help out our loon population. And actually the lasting impact of um, the, the oil spills actually on juvenile loons. So this is, we're not really used to seeing this plumage or uh, this look of feathers uh, for Minnesota loons here, but this is a juvenile and they actually spend uh, quite a bit of their, the first years of their life away from Minnesota. And the timing of the event meant that adults had already migrated back to Minnesota. Um, they were rushing back here to, to establish their breeding territory, but juveniles actually spend about two to four years going between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean um, before they return to Minnesota to find uh, a breeding territory themselves. And so a lot of the loss of life was actually juvenile loons. And the research um, that came out of the oil spill found that about 600 to 1,000 Minnesota loons were lost. Our current population estimate from the DNR is that we have about 12,000 in the state of Minnesota. And so to put in context, 600 to 1,000 and what that means for um, the, the overall population health, uh, loons are a very long-lived bird. And so taking out all those juveniles will really affect um, the family trees of these birds for many years to come, which leads to the work of our program and um, and that we are working to restore and preserve the population of loons here in Minnesota. This um, work that we're doing, this is in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Minnesota DNR. 
our program, we have partners with the DNR that are working right now on loon surveys and shoreline acquisitions and working with lake associations, but we are all working uh, for the health and population of our loons because uh, Stephen and I know from talking to people all around the state in the last almost two years that people love loons here and, and they want to make sure that they see them for many years to come. So the work of our program, uh, we're really focused on talking about the issue of lead. Uh, lead has been removed from many common household products from paint to gasoline. Uh, there's a huge effort right now to remove lead pipes from our infrastructure that affects our drinking water, but lead still persists, especially in ammunition and fishing tackle. And our program is focused uh, really on fishing tackle since um, that's how loons are impacted the most from lead. And so uh, I could share quite a bit about all the fascinating parts of a loon's natural history, but uh, the, the two main things that, uh, that lead to loons being affected by lead are the fish that they eat, um, and how they digest that food. And so loons are piscivores or fish eaters. They primarily feed on fish. So Minnesota is a great place to be in the summertime. Um, and they're also a visual predators. So they need clean, clear water um, in order to find their food. And when they do find that big fish, they have to swallow it whole. And loons have an incredible ability to dive all the way down to the bottom of a lake. They can dive 130 feet deep. Uh, they can hold their breath for over five minutes. And so their ability to dive means that they are able to reach the bottom, uh, unlike other uh, birds that live on the water. And so there are two ways that loons will um, ingest fit lead fishing tackle. And the first is, and maybe if you are an angler, you've had this happen to you. It's the fish that got away. So uh, if your line has ever broken or um, you've had a fish that you just can't get that jig out of its throat and you have to cut the line. So sometimes we have fish that still have fishing tackle attached to them or inside of them. And if a loon eats that fish, it will then have the fishing tackle inside of their body. And then the second way is uh, loons have to um, pick up small rocks off the bottom of lakes to aid in their digestion. They have uh, part of their stomach called a gizzard and they pick up these rocks, but they sometimes pick up your lost fishing tackle. Um, and then the, that enters into their gizzard um, where the acids in their body breaks down the lead and it enters their bloodstream. So um, we like to, to have everybody try and you know, see how hard it is just visually looking at a picture to tell the difference between a rock or a split shot. You might call it a sinker. Um, but a split shot is just a small weight that's attached to a line to, to give it some more extra weight so it sinks. Uh, so uh, if you just want to look at this picture for a couple more seconds and think, see how many split shot you can find. And it's a bit challenging. So there's nine. Um, they really blend in well with those small rocks. Uh, and this is just to show that a loon that's diving down to the bottom of a lake is not going to be able to tell the difference between a rock or a split shot. And it's just going to pick up uh, whatever it can find at the bottom. Um, so uh, that's why we need to keep these out of our water um, and out of the environment. So this is uh, an x-ray uh, of a loon that passed away from lead poisoning. Uh, you can see it had a lot of tackle inside of it. Um, actually, a, the very smallest split shot that was inside of that this loon would be enough to sicken um, it with lead poisoning. The current estimate nationally is that about 20 to 25 percent of loon deaths are caused by ingesting lead fishing tackle. Um, and our program, we really believe that we can uh, reverse that and we we can prevent these deaths, these unnecessary deaths, just by making small changes with the type of tackle that we are using when we're fishing. Um, when a loon becomes sick with lead poisoning, this is a very slow and painful death. Uh, the loon will not be able to swim, will not be able to dive, cannot fly. Um, as the lead enters its bloodstream, it has trouble breathing. Uh, loons can't really retreat to land either. 
Uh, sick and loons are, are seldom found, and if they are, it's really um, too late for them, and so they have to be humanely euthanized. Um, and from the point of ingesting just a small piece of tackle to when it becomes sick is about two to three weeks. Um, and so we just want to help everybody know about all the alternatives that are out there. So I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Stephen, who's going to share quite a bit about the work that we're doing about uh, different types of tackle and his experience uh, fishing with so many different types. Thanks, Kelly. So uh, the death of loons and other wildlife is easily preventable by using a non-toxic alternative option. So our program is twofold. So obviously we raise awareness about the danger of the lead fishing tackle, but we also raise awareness about the many alternatives that are out there. So as you can see on the left, these products look the same as uh, any other lead tackle you might find at the store in your own tackle box. And they have very similar performance as well too. So in the case of tungsten, which I believe is the most popular alternative out there, uh, tungsten is a better performing alternative. It's more dense, it's more sensitive, it sinks faster, and it's also uh, it has a smaller profile due to its density. And I think it's already the norm with ice fishing, those small uh, tungsten jigs, as you can see, uh, my brother-in-law caught a big northern with that. And uh, you could use them for open water too, where I caught that rainbow trout. So we have a list of over uh, 100 lead-free tackle retailers on the web. We think it's the uh, most comprehensive on the internet. You could access it through the QR code, or they also drop a link in the chat as well. Next slide. So uh, making the switch. So in this slide, you can see photos of folks who are going lead free. They're disposing their lead tackle. And a uh, fun fact on the left, it's Kelly's tackle. So Kelly cleaned out hers, her grandpa's and her dad's. In the center photo, it's my tackle that I also inherited from my dad and my older brother. And on the right side is a very passionate individual who emailed us, Joe from uh, Owatonna is the name he gave him. And uh, he is very passionate about our cause and our our issue and went lead free without even having any uh, lead free alternatives from us to incentivize. So he cleaned it out, even went as far as uh, pinching his split shots and worm weights to make sure that no one would use them. He even took out the uh, eyelets of his jigs as well, too. Next slide. So uh, going lead free, why did I do it? Obviously, there's the uh, environmental reasons that we'll cover in the slide and have already covered, but uh, I just wanted to walk the walk, practice what I preach. And uh, there's only so much I can learn about this topic from reading, writing, making presentations, but I, I learned a lot of uh, valuable insights from just doing it myself. So I think it made me a, a better person to be in this position to encourage behavior change since I've done it myself. And for youth, I think uh, having a mentor is very important for starting any outdoor recreational activity. So I try to take out my little cousins as much as I can. And I have a lot of them. They're all probably under the age of 12. So it just kind of felt wrong to have them use a lead when they're out fishing with me. And for many others, youth in their lives could be their children too. So that could be a factor as well. And in terms of my morals, I, like many people, grew up knowing that lead was toxic in terms of the human health effects. So uh, it's been pretty ingrained in me growing up that, you know, lead is bad. And uh, even before I knew about its impacts on loons and wildlife, I always kind of had that thought in the back of my head that this doesn't feel right to be handling, using, potentially polluting the environment with lead. So uh, I didn't also, I didn't want to have that negative association with such a positive experience fishing. So it was either I give up uh, fishing or I give up lead tackle, and obviously I'm going to give up lead tackle. And in terms of uh, environmental ethics, I'm an angler, I'm a hunter, and uh, I'm an outdoor enthusiast, so I do admire wildlife. And uh, a byproduct of my hobbies is that I handle and harvest wildlife species. And what we're taught when we're young, when we first started fishing, first set of hunting, is that we want to minimize any slow, painful, wasteful, prolonged injuries or death. So knowing that a lead tackle, even lead ammo can cause this, just really didn't sit well with me. And chances are that you know, my lead tackle, I fish mostly in the metro area, so chances are my lead tackle will end up in a loon. But even if the lead tackle ammo I use doesn't end up in an animal, like I said, it just kind of felt wrong to be using lead tackle when I grew up knowing how toxic it was. And uh, in terms of my experience, these two bullet points kind of sum it up, but I'll also go over it in the next few slides. So uh, the walleye in the top right, I caught it with a bismuth and tin jig. It looks just like a, any other lead jig that I've used in the past. And uh, my first thought was, I can't believe that worked. And also I realized that's kind of a ludicrous thought because this jig looks, looks like a any other jig I've used in the past. So why would I be surprised if uh, two jigs that look the same work? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I caught that walleye and there's a lot of factors to uh, landing a fish as we know. And I highly doubt the walleye came after it because it was bismuth or tin. I bet it came after it because of the color, the style, the presentation, and obviously the live leech that I threw on there too. And uh, overall, my experience has been quite positive. I'd say it's non-detrimental. Non uh, I'd be lying if I said that I caught a lot more fish with lead-free tackle. I'd also be lying if I said a lot, I caught a lot fewer fish. So my uh, ability to catch fish hasn't changed. My uh, love for the hobby hasn't changed. I don't feel threatened by lead-free tackle or anything. It's been overall a positive experience. And uh, especially with the case of tungsten on the right, you can see a, 
a small northern pike I caught with a one eighth tungsten jig. It looks like a small jig, but tungsten, like I said, it's more dense. And I caught this fish uh, using a yeah a tungsten jig, and I also landed it and found there was a, a lead jig in its mouth. So funny enough, I removed it and uh, did my part in removing lead from that environment. But uh, when I caught this, I, I just thought to myself, you know, losing tackle, it's inevitable. And if there's one angler out there who hasn't lost tackle, then they're probably the best angler in the world. But losing tackle is inevitable. If I had to choose, I'd lose a, a non-toxic option. And in this case, someone lost a, a lead option, and I, of course, had to remove it. And like Kelly mentioned, uh, fish, they snap off your line. They have lead tackle attached. And I caught this up in the Cross Lake, so it's a rather small northern. It could have been a, a dinner for a loon, too. So that's a kind of scary thought that was all. Next slide. So for challenges, folks often talk about the costs, and this is very true, and I do validate those uh, concerns. And uh, in most cases, lead-free options do cost more and may have fewer quantity too. But for me personally, uh, there are two reasons that I'm okay for this, that the higher cost is there. Uh, the first reason that uh, I think it's uh, okay is that tungsten is a higher performing alternative. And most people often think of tungsten, they think of uh, the cost. And uh, if you want to think big picture, tungsten is a scarcer metal than lead, but Tungsten, like I mentioned, it's a higher performing alternative. It's more sensitive, has a smaller profile, and it sinks faster. And it's also denser too. So the extra cost might be worth it for certain anglers to uh, pursue the extra performance. So uh, for example, of density on the right side, you can see uh, two inline spinners that I bought. On the left is a lead version of it, and on the right is a tungsten version of it. The tungsten one looks very similar in shape and size as the lead one, but it's actually heavier. It's one sixth of an ounce, and the lead one is one eighth of an ounce. And in this case, the lead one cost about five dollars, I want to say, and the tungsten one cost about uh, cost at about four twenty nine or something. So this is one incident where uh, the tungsten one was actually cheaper. And a second reason why I could put up with the cost personally is that uh, I don't hesitate and already spend a lot of money on rods, reels, fishing lines, and uh, gas for my cars. So all these other fishing expenses and assets I already spend money on, and of course I spend money on tackle already. So the extra cost of lead-free tackles is very small compared to all these other assets and expenses of mine. And for some folks, they have uh, cabins, watercrafts, and go on fishing charters too. So if you think of those big cost items, the, the cost of lead-free tackle is very marginal, very minimal. And uh, another challenge is that lead-free tackle might not be as available on store shelves. And in my experience, they're mostly online from uh, small to mid-sized businesses. So I do feel good supporting them, but there are also uh, big manufacturers out there that some of you that might have heard of them already that have some lead-free products. So for example, clam tackle has a lot of uh, tungsten jigs during the winter. They also have open water jigs too. Northland, we all probably know they have a lot of lead jigs, but they have a lead-free product line that we use for as a program, the Nature Jig made out of bismuth and tin. And Water Gremlin, we also know have a lot of lead tackle, lead sinkers, but they have a uh, tin split shots as well. And fun fact, all these are Minnesota-based companies too. And another chance is that uh, it's not a quick process. It's a long and slow process, and this could involve uh, researching, replacing tackle, visiting stores if you try to go in person and uh, waiting for online orders, shipping times, et cetera. And also the, uh, the time to uh, dispose of light tackle might be time consuming as well. So it's not a quick process. We don't expect to happen overnight. And the environmental benefits, we've already highlighted enough about the uh, wildlife and environmental benefits, but there's also a mental benefit to knowing that there's a, a good sense of environmental stewardship out there where I'm using non-toxic tackle. And uh, tungsten performance, I can't talk about enough. It definitely is uh, quite a benefit. And when I was looking at a lead-free tackle, I found a lot of a variety of tungsten tackle techniques. So I discovered new uh, ways to be a more versatile angler. So for example, Ned rigging, I never ever tried Ned rigging until I bought a uh, tungsten Ned rig. And uh, you kind of need the tungsten for a Ned rig because it's very sensitive. You bounce the Ned rig off the bottom. So you feel the rocks, the soil, the sand. So a tungsten has exceeded lead in that sense where it's more sensitive and could also detect bites better as well. And a benefit that I didn't realize until after the fact, when I realized my tackle box was a lot lighter, was that I'm more practical with the quantity that I buy now. So like I mentioned, lead-free tackle might be more expensive, might come in fewer quantities. So for example, you find uh, 30 tin split shots for more than a, a bag of 60 lead split shots. In my whole life, I'll probably end up using lead, uh, 60 lead or 60 split shots, but for the next few summers, for this summer, I could probably suffice with 30 tin split shots. So. I've been more uh, practical, more realistic with what I truly need, and uh, my back is thankful too because I put all my tackle in my backpack. So it certainly uh, makes me uh, appreciate the quality over the quantity of tackle that I have. Next slide. So some tips and ideas for going lead-free. Uh, don't do it all at once. I tell people if you do it all at once, you're not going to be able to fish for a while, so you'll probably lose all your tackle. So you'll, uh, next time you buy 
tackle, which we all do, just consider lead-free options, and it's perfectly okay to have a 99% lead tackle box and a 1% lead-free tackle. Try that 1% if you like it, keep buying more. And uh, for for uh, evaluations, I break it up into personal and seasonal evaluations. Uh, personal evaluations, think about what you're already using now so, and see if they involve any lead or lead tackle. So for example, I grew up bass fishing mostly and I use mostly just steel hooks and plastic. I really like the uh, the unweighted uh, presentation of uh, just a plastic lure falling in the water. And I never really had any weights with my favorite uh, fishing methods. So I also use crankbaits. Most of those don't contain lead. They're mostly plastic, wood, steel. I also use a lot of uh, rubber plastic hollow body frogs, which mostly don't contain lead either. So I sat back and realized that I don't use that much lead in the few products that I use that do contain lead. I just swapped them out. It wasn't that much. And uh, at the end of season or start of seasons, also evaluate the tackle that you're using or don't intend to use or haven't used at all. I went lead free about the beginning of summer 2021 and I do my annual tackle box cleaning. So I wasn't just looking over lead tackle. I was looking over various plastics that I haven't used. And I noticed there were a lot that uh, I never used and just cleaned out. So it's a good benchmark between seasons to see what you don't use, what you don't intend to use to clean out your tackle. And next, uh, know what you're looking for when it comes to a lead free tackle. Uh, having the material and tackle type will narrow it on your search immensely. So I compare it to, you know, you go to a store, you want to look for American aid products and you ask someone, I want to buy American and they're, they're going to try to help you, but you've, you've got to narrow it down. So what I tell folks is uh, you got to have a, the material and tackle type that you're thinking of versus just looking for lead free. If you ask or look for lead free, it'll definitely yield some results. But if you narrow it down, it'll definitely narrow your search and help you immensely. And some materials are more commonly paired with more uh, tackle types. So for split shots, for example, currently tin split shots are quite popular. I've seen some uh, tungsten and split shots as well too. And for worm weights, it's almost always going to be tungsten and worm weights. And for jigs, it's almost always going to be tungsten and jigs, especially the skirted bass jigs that you see there, or the, uh, the round, your typical round jigs will be made out of bismuth and tin composite. So on the right side, you can see a, a variety of lead-free tackle. When I first started going lead-free, I just thought it'd be the round jigs and split shots that are lead-free. But the more I look, the more I realize there's a lot of lead-free tackle out there. So what I call the skirted bass jigs are very popular, and I started buying more of those. Spinner baits were kind of hard to find, but once I found one, I found a lot of them. And uh, different underspin jigs or bladed swim jigs or chatterbait styles, as they're known. So there, yeah, there's a lot out there, not just your typical uh, split shots and round jig heads. Next slide. So how do you know if your tackle contains lead? Well, manufacturer required by law to put a label on it if it does contain lead. And the warnings are quite small and you have to look really hard to find it. So in the case of this Mimic Minnow, which is also one of my favorite lures growing up, uh, you can see on the back side, there's a very small text that mentions that it contains lead. And to make it more confusing, even if the tackle is lead free, but may have been exposed to lead in the manufacturing process, it'll still have this label on there. So I compare it to food allergies. If a, if a food very clearly looks like it's gluten free, but may have been exposed to gluten in the manufacturing process. They won't say it's gluten free, for example. And in short, I know it could be confusing to look for these labels and digest the language, but what I tell folks is that uh, if there's a heavy piece of metal on it, and if it doesn't say lead free or doesn't list the alternative, then it probably is lead. And uh, the reality is that most fishing tackle with any density to it contains lead. And this is based off the uh, current historic trends in the fishing tackle industry. And usually when they are lead-free products, they won't explicitly say lead-free. They uh, say uh, tungsten or tin. So, for example, tungsten jig, tin split shots, rather than saying lead-free. Sometimes they may even say environmentally friendly as well, too. Next slide. So now that I know about a lead-free tackle, you might be wondering what to do with your uh, lead tackle. Well, uh, like Kelly mentioned, we used to do a tackle exchanges, but we started our positions during COVID. So we obviously can do the hand-to-hand uh, -hand contact in-person events. And we had to think of a project that would achieve the same goals, which is to collect lead and also give more lead free tackle out there. So we thought of a lead collection kits. These are just essentially boxes that contain lead free tackle samples to exchange, to use an incentive, but also a bunch of uh, education outreach materials. And we also uh, did uh, virtual trainings for interested partners throughout the state to make them the experts and local, uh, the local get the lead out satellite staff, <laughs> if you want to say, to talk about this with their local communities. So we send out collection kits to 45 plus partners across the state, mostly in North Central Minnesota, the Brainerd, Bemidji, Grand Rapids areas, mostly Lake Association, but also environmental nonprofits and uh, County Household Hazard Waste Facilities, or HHWs for short. And these are the, 
the ultimate location that we want folks to bring their lead tackle to because uh, HHW facilities are properly equipped and licensed to manage lead waste. Don't throw your own audit lead in your household trash or recycle. It might end up back in the environment. And as I mentioned, HHWs are properly licensed and equipped to manage lead waste. We've been told they're recycling to batteries too. And each county in Minnesota has an HHW facility. I'd recommend checking your county's hours for their uh, seasons of operations. Some might just be open during the summer. Some are open two days a week. Some are open five days a week. And for those folks in greater Minnesota, yours might be further away. They might have certain satellite sites that are open just for a weekend. And I recommend uh, waiting until you have a, enough has a household has a waste to make a trip worthwhile because uh, it'd be tough with gas prices now to drive one and a half hours to drop off five ounces of lead. So just wait till you accumulate other household trash that you've been trying to get rid of at your HHW facility. And last summer, with the help of our partners, we collected over 207 pounds of lead. And Kelly and I are eternally grateful for them because we were mostly working from home. So we had folks throughout the summer collecting lead for us. You can see some of the partners on the slide there. And on the top right, we also have a, it's one of a kind right now, a metal drop box that we have at Soccer Channel at Van Ness Lakes. And this is a notorious area where I think at least two dozen trumpet of swans have ingested lead tackle and have died over the past three years. So we worked with the uh, Van Ness Lakes Area Water Management Organization to install a drop box there. If you are in the East Metro area, feel free to drop off your lead tackle there. There might be uh, some lead free samples in there for you to grab as well. Next slide. So we do have a rebate program that's currently live. We wanna help out both retailers and consumers be able to buy more lead free tackle. So this program provides a uh, small bait and tackle stores, retail establishments, with a 35% rebate on uh, bait and on lead free tackle purchases, a maximum order of $2,000. So the, the goal is they buy it wholesale, buy it bulk and they resell it and they make a profit on it. So people, if you're ineligible, you can encourage uh, your favorite bait and tackle store owner, your friend who owns a bait and tackle store to apply. You could even assist them with applying too. So if you're a bait and tackle store owner, feel free to apply. The web link has been provided. The application is fairly short. There's uh, our email there too. So feel free to contact us to uh, guide you to buy lead free tackle. And with that, I'll let transition to Kelly to finish off the presentation. Um, so we've given you a lot to think about today. So just a, a few short takeaways um, a, in, is to just encourage you as Stephen shared to try and find lead free tackle to buy some lead free track tackle. If you've never fished with lead free, give it a try this summer. Um, we know that it's harder to find. Uh, we're working on that. We wanna help help consumers to get it in their, in their local stores as well. Uh, if you're thinking about recycling your lead, please remember to do it properly as Steven said, it cannot go in your garbage, cannot go in your household recycling. It really has to be recycled properly because lead is a toxic material. And um, the third bullet point, uh, a big part of our, our outreach this summer is actually with youth. Um, I was down in Prior Lake this morning visiting a summer camp of uh, six to nine year olds. And my big point to them is to talk to other people about this. So I always ask like, do you fish with other people? Are you gonna be on a boat sometime this summer or fishing from the dock with someone else? Can you just tell them about how dangerous lead is for loons and eagles and swans and people and just share this message. Um, and so our, our work with kids too is to, I, uh, you know, Steven's made a big transition and he fishes a lot with uh, his young cousins, but uh, just trying to get these kids started off with lead-free tackle in their tackle boxes or start off their tackle boxes just with lead-free tackle. So it's what they're used to fishing with and, and um, it's what they know that they should be fishing with. Um, and so th that's a really important component of our work as well. And then of course, um, as Stephen mentioned, uh, I cleaned out all my lead. I, I couldn't, as the more I talked about this, as Stephen said, and him too, like we couldn't just keep that at home. Um, and, but I spent many years uh, teaching kids fishing and using lead tackle. And I also will say that it's a slow process. And so, and we know that. So if you are still fishing with lead or hunting with lead, please just protect your human health, your personal health, um, because lead is dangerous for people as well. And just uh, make sure you wash your hands before you eat or drink and, and just be mindful of, of your health as well. So um, I will, oops, uh, turn it over to, um, our contact information, uh, if you, you can reach out to our 
let out email um, and uh, you can go ahead and address it to Stephen and I if you want to. We both check that email um, quite a bit too. Our program, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to give us a follow there, we like to highlight uh, lead-free manufacturers and share interesting things about loons and, and the work that we're doing. So um, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, see if we have any questions. Thanks, Kelly and Stephen. That's really great information. Um, loons are fascinating animals, that's for sure. And it's, it's really great to hear more about them and their life, life cycle. And all the alternatives that are out there, um, the proposal you that are listening, if you have some specific questions, again, please put those in the Q&A. We have a few that came in, but we have time, I think, for quite a few more. So please go ahead and ask your questions. There were uh, a few from Michelle. I think you addressed a lot of them related to the program and how you can get engaged and involved. You have some of the kits and stuff. But if should they contact that email that you put up there? Is that if someone wants to do an exchange, you have, you know, you can get them information and materials. They can do that. Definitely reach out to us at that email address. If you're part of a lake association or you know people and your family who are part of a lake association, reach out to us too. We are always um, trying to grow partnerships um, with people around the state and know that we haven't touched all areas of the state yet, but we're working hard to do that. And she did specifically ask about the get the let out decals. Do you make those available if folks are willing to get those out there and about? Oh, we can get some stickers to people. Yep, we can get okay. some stickers out there. And um, Benji, I think it's been in a couple of times, the uh, list of companies that you use most often, um, that's on your website and we've got that link in the Q&A. Um, Steven, would you say it's been, that list is growing? I mean, what's the trend? I mean, obviously there's been a lot more in tungsten. Are there other types of uh, materials that are being used or wh how, what are you seeing? On, on development of manufacturing. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, bismuth and tin alloys out there for mostly brown uh, pan fish jigs. Uh, tin split shots is quite popular. I know Dave had asked about uh, split shots in the chat. Yeah, mostly it's quite popular tin split shots, but there are some tungsten split shots out there. And as I mentioned, they might be more expensive and they'll have fewer in quantity, but they'll work. So those are probably the only two materials I know of now that were are being used for split shots. In your um, photo of some of the alternatives, there was a, is it a drop shot or a, a heavier weight with the kind of likes like a spinning top? What are those made from and how do you use those? Uh, which, that was it the ones on the, on the top? Yeah. I think the yeah. egg sinker, Stephen. Oh, the egg sinker. <laughs> I personally have much experience with egg sinkers, but I do know they're used and made out of steel for our river fishing. Okay. But yeah, there are some, it might've been the rocks in the further up for the drop shot too. Those are another alternative option too. And are, are those made from tungsten usually too, or? Yeah, some could be made out of tungsten. Tungsten uh, drop shots are quite popular now for, yeah, for fishing especially. But yeah, there are some that are made out of rocks or natural materials as well. We, uh, when I was working the program, it was a challenge to try to find walking sinkers, many, what we call Lindy rigs. Um, Live bait snails are really popular for walleye fishing in Minnesota. Have you have you seen anything uh, newer on the market that's you know in, in the walking sinker style? Kelly's yeah, shaking I've, her head. No, I think <laughs> I've seen some a, a very small homemade at home uh, manufacturer that makes them, but there is one out there that I know bullet weights to make us steel walking sinkers. I I saw this when I was looking at myself too, so I haven't seen them on the shelves available. But I know bullet weights. They only sell through retailers. So yeah, I do know for sure they have steel walking sinkers. Well, there's probably room in the market. So if anyone wants to develop some more, <laughs> that would be good. Uh, cer certainly, as I said, really popular in Minnesota. Uh, that's how a lot of us grew up fishing, I know, trying to catch walleyes. So it'd be good to see more of those. Okay. Um, aside from the, Michael asked, how can, aside from our purchasing decisions, how can consumers encourage or pressure manufacturers to stop using lead? Kelly, you wanna take that one? I think, I think um, one thing Steve and I have heard from stores is that people aren't buying the lead free. Sometimes that's in the actual stores. And so we really try and tell people like, 
put pressure on the stores that you go to and say, Hey, do you have any lead free tackle? And, um, and if they don't, <laughs> then try make, and if they're a smaller bait shop, encourage them to apply for our rebate program, of course. But I think, um, it's consumer demand, right? It's, it's bait. It's these stores realizing that people want to be able to buy this in their stores and, and hopefully they'll, they'll be more of a, a transition to lead free. Cause I know when I was buying tackle for the summer to teach kids, I couldn't find lead free, um, in the stores I was going to. And so, um, it's really important for us to make sure that uh, people know about all these options. That's why we're so happy that we have this big list and we can share as much lead free tackle as possible, especially with with people who are teaching young kids too. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the distribution process and it's it's probably changed a little bit since I worked in a bait store, but it's still really driven by um, wholesale reps, right? And those folks are visiting, they're meeting with the um, sporting goods managers who make the purchases for the season in their sporting goods department, whether it's a big retailer or at the store level. So talking to those people, those store managers that are in charge of the purchasing, that's a good route. And, and just say, hey, when you're talking to your distri distribution folks, you know, we want this, we need this. So that's a really great when you're in the store to ask to talk to the, the manager who's purchasing and, and stocking in your store. So. Uh, go ahead, Kelly. I was just going to say the, the first time I ever saw a lead free option in my local bait shop was glass. And I was really excited and I told my supervisor, I needed more money <laughs> to buy out the glass jigs and, um, and fish with those for the summer with, with the young summer campers I worked with. So, um, don't know if they continued carrying glass jigs or not, but I bought out their stock. So, um. But uh, Michael had a follow up question too about legislative solutions and um, whether or not they've been considered and that there has been success in removing lead from other items like paint. And uh, of course we saw that in um, lead shot for waterfowl hunting. Um, do you want to say anything about that? Yep, so Steve and I, this is, we are just an education and outreach based program and um, we um, know about things that are happening with the legislature, but our, the point of our work is not to influence uh, legislative action around this issue, but um, as private citizens, you may do so. Yeah, obviously um, contact your legislature, share your thoughts and opinions with them. Um, in the DNR, we have um, adopted within our educational programs also a lead free stance. So within our learn to fish programs, with our learn to hunt programs, we are using only lead alternatives or, or non lead um, bullets and, and shot. And, and um, our outdoor program, I will say, for when we're at a range where that is all regulated, as you know, at the PCA, I think is really involved in regulating these shooting ranges. They are collecting and recycling those. So we will use lead at the, sh at the shooting ranges. But out in the field, when we're out for our programming, we, we do lead free. And then, of course, our, our tackle is all lead free, too, that we use. Um, we talked about partnering. Contact you if you want to be a partner. Um, someone asked uh, Dave if there were other alternatives to split shot besides the tin split, tin split shot. Yep. Yeah. Like I said earlier, tin split shots by far the most popular. and. You could see water gum and split shots pretty much at any bait store. But uh, yeah, tungsten split shots are becoming a thing now. And I've seen, I think, two companies with tungsten split shots. And the beautiful thing is that once one company starts it, the other tries to compete. So everyone tries to do a certain product. Yeah, and you touched on this earlier that many times some of these, um, especially smaller bait stores, may not have them in their store. but You're finding more and more options. I think a lot of the links that you have are for online options from around the country, right? That you can potentially um, may have more luck. And we're seeing that with um, on the hunting side too. There's more ammunition broadly available on the internet, or at least there used to be for all this sh ammo shortages that we we're dealing with the last few years. But yeah, definitely do that. Check out those options and, and look online. Uh, Nathan asked if we know the, what the blood level of a loon is after ingesting a lead split shot. 
And do we know at what blood level, blood lead level can affect the lens body? Do you have any of that information? Yes. So um, when lead is is toxic, to they begin to feel the toxic effects of lead at 0 0.02 parts per million, and then at one par part per million, lead is fatal. So um, it's a very small range and doesn't really does not take much. Uh, that that radiograph that we shared, uh, that loon had a lot of lead tackle in it. Um, and if you consider how many fish loons are eating in a day, uh, they could be potentially eating several meals <laughs> that, and have several fish go into them uh, that have lead attached or in the fish too. Yeah, it's it's um, it is not very much, right? A small. I mean, often I think they talk about one split shot um, can potentially poison a loon or an eagle. Uh, and again, the bird biology is that that crop that you mentioned you know, associated with their digestion. They many bird, I think maybe all birds ingest some sort of grit or rocks or pebbles to be able to grind up the you know, the coarse food that they get into um, digestible materials. And so that action, of course, lead is soft and easily um, can be um, broken down and, and, and gets into the bloodstream through that process. So, um, and a little bit more on biology, maybe you can add to what I heard years ago is that there'd been research on what loons eat and the size. And because at first I was like, well, yeah, a northern will bite you off, but you know, no loon's going to swallow a northern, right? But that's not true, right? They actually, I remember at least from research, and maybe there's more information on that, that they can swallow up to a 12 inch northern. Is that right? Stephen, yeah. I think you have, yeah, I think you have some information about like the biggest fish and the biggest amount of lead that's been found in a fish, too. Yeah, I think I've seen found some in ranges uh, being 12 to 18 fit, 12 to 18 inch fish and yeah, there has been some research on a uh, size of lead that had been found in loons over a long period of time. I remember one that caught my eye was a a pyramid sinker, what they use out in the coast that was about two ounces. We have a photo that we use in previous presentations of a, a four ounce jig head in a loon too. So big big tackle is a uh, problematic as well too. Yeah, you wouldn't think that they could swallow that big of a northern, but uh apparently they can and um it doesn't take a very big northern with all their teeth to slice off your jig, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, just it's not, you know, that that's how they're getting it, right? Or well, through the ingesting of the pebbles on the bottom too. But, um, yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. To me, that pointed to like, well, for one, and I'm guilty of this because I'm cheap sometimes, but keeping your line clean, you know, making sure it's not, uh, it's not nicked so that it doesn't easily break. So that's one thing that we can do too, is just making sure we're using strong enough line and line that's in good condition because mono in particular over years that can photo degrade and become brittle and really break really easy. So one thing just to do is to make sure you're, when you're throwing that jig out there that it's, it's got, you've got good quality line so it doesn't easily break off. So. Uh, we had another question um, related to tungsten. Um, that tungsten is very hard, and when making tungsten jigs, that tungsten is soldered onto a hook. Is is that is that use some sort of lead-free solder? Do you know anything about the specifics on that, Stephen? How they make those jigs? I don't. I know. I know bismuth and tin. Oh, lead is popular first because it's very very abundant and has a low melting point i know bismuth and tin people melt and uh mold it onto a hook like a jig yeah. but with tungsten i think it's i want to say it's made of a, a tungsten powder mixed with something else to make it hard to give it that that strong but probably in a, probably in a mold right yeah. so it, yep. it cools directly on the jig so i wouldn't say probably not any soldering but that was going to be one of my other questions and well benji did you have any um additions on that issue well, I was going to say I've done some of the making ice fishing jigs, and we used a lead-free solder on that, so that's pretty readily available to have lead-free solder. Okay. So it's pretty. Do you know fun. what the material material was that you were using? We were using tin and soldering a okay, just a little hook onto it. So, so I had a related question 
about making jigs because well, I didn't know you were doing that, Benji, but a lot of people do that or have. Lead was pretty easily available and cheap. Um, so um, folks were doing a lot of that in their garages or whatever. Um, is there ability or do you know, is, it, is it possible that folks can use some of these other? It sounds like you can, uh, at least with tin. Do you have any other information about making your own jigs that are not lead? Uh, I've seen Bolka Desmet tin blocks. They're more expensive because, like I said, lead is very abundant, so it's cheaper. But yeah, I think it perhaps could be a, at the same way, just going to a metal recycler, a metal vendor, and and buying in bulk the blocks and then melting your own and making your own. So I do think it is possible. Yeah, and the follow up to that, Clayton is asking if there's any resources or how people would find out about making their own lead free tackle. It's a good question. Might be something you need to add to the website. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely too sure. I think Benji, Steven, do you have any thoughts? Go I was ahead. gonna say, I think Stephen and I have just been too worried about people taking lead that's being recycled to then recast into lead jigs. And so we haven't really delved too deeply into helping people make lead free themselves, but that's a great thing for us to look into. Benji, do you have any thoughts on or resources on that for 10 or at least, I guess? Um, there's a website called Tackle Underground, I believe, and that's where I've seen some information on it before but it's one of those the, the university of youtube you can find a lot of information on that but um yeah i remember i remember a long time ago when we had a neighbor that would take old there's a junkyard just down the street and they take old wheel weights and melt those down and cast them so which isn't the best practice but you can currently buy some bismuth and, and stuff like that on the market and tin i know you can i've used that before but I, I don't melt my own. I use um, pre-made little blades that I just I paint mm -hmm. and put an eye on and solder it all okay. the time. So, uh, anything in the chat that we missed at all? Questions it doesn't look all. like it. I think we got through all the Q and A questions. Yeah, I think it was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Kelly and Stephen for joining us today. So, and Jeff, thank you for hosting. So uh, next week, we have harvesting wild rice coming up. So Nicholas and our dean are biologists up north and our Northwoods guru, Keg Kiger, is going to join us and talk about harvesting wild rice. So that'll be a great talk. So please join in next week. Again, you can go to our website, uh, minnesotadnr.gov slash outdoor skills and sign up for any of those programs that we have coming up or review the past ones. So, and just as a reminder, as you close out your programs, you will have a little survey that'll pop up. Please answer those questions. Um, helps us know who's here and, and what we can do to serve you, serve the public better, I guess. So we're always open for suggestions. My email, email is on that website. Email me if you have any suggestions or questions and we can pass that information along, so. Yeah, any future topics, we're looking to try to build out a fall schedule. So if there are a particular skill or outdoor activity you'd like to see us cover, that uh, we, we welcome those ideas also. Definitely. So. We'll okay, one last chance. Any, any questions? Uh, Michael says thanks. So, um, yes, Kelly and Stephen, it was great to have you here. Always good to hear what's happening over at PCA and um, really appreciate all your work on this issue. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. We enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everybody. Hope to see you again.